everybody's ready, we can start with that. Everybody turn off their microphones, if you can, please, so we don't get delay echoes. Okay. In the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Sangha, most excellent. I take refuge until enlightenment is reached. By the merit of generosity and other good deeds, may I attain Buddhahood for the sake of all sentient beings. In the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Sangha, most excellent. I take refuge until enlightenment is reached. By the merit of generosity and other good deeds, may I attain Buddhahood for the sake of all sentient beings. Sangye chodang so ki chonam la Shangju bardu dagni kapsu chi Dagi jin so ki pe so nam gi Jola penchi sangye ju pa May all mothers, sentient beings, boundless as the sky have happiness and the causes of happiness. May they be liberated from suffering and the causes of suffering. May they never be separated from the happiness that is free from sorrow. May they rest in equanimity, free from attachment and aversion. May all mother sentient beings, boundless as the sky, have happiness and the causes of happiness. May they be liberated from suffering and the causes of suffering. May they never be separated from the happiness that is free from sorrow. May they rest in equanimity, free from attachment and aversion. Manam kadam yam pe sem chen tam she de wa dang de we gur dang dem bar jor chi. Dug nao dang de nao gi gu dang dra wa jor chi. Dug now may pay de wa dung me draw wa jorchi. Nay ring jag dung ni dung draw we dung nam la ne pa jorchi. Okay, everybody take a deep breath. Hold it. Exhale. Another deep breath. Hold it. Exhale. One more deep breath. Hold it. And exhale. Okay, thank you very much. So if you have any questions uh, while we're talking, don't hesitate to turn your microphone on and just uh, speak right up and uh, we'll answer whatever we can for you. If, um, let me see if I turn this here. And uh, we are recording this and um, we don't have uh, an immediate plan uh, right now, but we are archiving these uh, teachings and hopefully we're going to be able to put them together on some kind of a format, maybe YouTube. So if anybody has an aversion to having their image being on the picture or something like that, and you want to go to a, uh, a little picture, an avatar type picture, you can change your image to some other picture or just blank. So uh, you can do that by stopping the video. If you look in the lower left-hand corner of your screen, you see that there's a mute button and there's a stop video button. So if you do the stop video, your image goes away and either your name comes up or a, uh, or a picture that you have designated. It would be very rare that any of um, the participants' photos would be shown unless, uh, uh, yeah, it would be very rare. Well, I just want to let people know. Uh, so, um, okay. So I want to start out. We've, we've been talking about a number of things. We've been talking about how to meditate. And we, at the same time, we've also been partaking in the Bardo Todal teachings, which are based on uh, the idea that, that um, we go through this cycle of birth and death over and over and over again. 
we've all been born many times and we've all have died many times. And it's not that, you know, we as our individual name, our individual body has lived, but it's just, it's the continuation, the continuum of, of human beings, of all beings, all sentient beings that is in this, this unending cycle that um, we are part of. So recognizing that the reason why we are doing this, why we are on this cycle, why we are caught in this wheel is because we continually desire to have this life, to have, uh, to have a body. And because we have this body, we are all caught in this cycle of suffering. Not that our whole entire life is suffering, but that everything is subject to suffering. The things that we find that are very pleasurable to us uh, change and they change and they can be suffering. Uh, the, the, the perfect example is our life, our body. We're born fresh and clean and clear and so on. And then we have to learn all these things and all this innocence gets turned into confusion, gets turned into jealousies, get turned into hatreds, get turned into uh, desires and so on like that. So as a child, we have this pure, innocent love, but then it gets, it gets corrupted as we go older and so on. And then we get sick, we start getting illnesses, colds and fevers, and we get injured, things begin to happen to us and so on. So our pleasurable life has all these little traps in it. And then if we're fortunate enough to grow older, then our body begins to slow down, our body begins to change, our hair changes color, our skin loses its texture, our memory begins to fade, uh, our endurance begins to fade away. All these things begin to happen. So what was all this wonderful life we were having begins to deteriorate and fade away. So we have suffering like that. And then finally we, we go through death. We go through the bardo of death where we give up our body, we, we have to give up our body, we have to give up our mind, our brain, and all the thoughts, all the memories and so on go away and so on. And then we go back into this cycle of rebirth, of going into the bardo of reality. And this is what the teachings on the bardo todal have been about. So in this cycle, we're, we're on this cycle because of our um, our karma, the, the results of actions that we have taken, either good karma or bad karma. And it's a combination of this that manifests itself in this particular life that we have now. We can analyze that. We need to look at that. And that's what we've been doing through looking at the skills that we uh, develop from our meditation to be able to get a real objective view of this and, and to be able to understand what the compounds are that make up our life, what makes up the karma. You know, and the karma is, has causes, there are things that cause karma. Karma means action. And then there is a result to the action, there's a result to the karma. So as we've talked that, that in human beings, we have six human realms that we live in, that we manifest in. And it's a combination of all those realms that simultaneously are, are, are taking place. It's like being an actor in a play. And sometimes the characters are, are playing bad guys, sometimes they're playing good guys, sometimes they're playing dumb guys, sometimes they're playing different characters, all within this same play. So we're kind of like doing that ourselves for real. But we don't recognize it that way. But when we can step back and objectively take a look at this, we can see that this is what we've been doing and this is what others are doing. So the six realms are the human realm, the jealous God realm, the God realm itself, then the animal realm, what we call the hungry ghost realm, the uh, the, that are that are miserable and, and, and greedy and uh, have the suffering of their miserliness. And then the hell realms, those beings who have done terrible things and are constantly suffering a death and rebirth 
in the hell realms. So we go into a fair amount of detail in talking about this and other Buddhism 101 classes and so on. There's books devoted to that. So we can talk about this more later on. But at least for us to recognize that we go through this manifestation, that we are part of this play. So the question that I want to get to is, what role do you want to play? Which role do you think you are playing? You know, what realm are you part of? The human realm, the God realm, the jealous God realm, the animal realm, the hungry ghost realm, or the hell realm? You know, so I think that everybody might think, oh, I'd like to be a God. That would be a pretty wonderful thing. But gods have their problems too. And we analyze that. The answer to the question is, is that we want to be in the human realm. Because in the human realm, we have the ability to be able to transcend. The other realms are kind of fixed, they're locked. They have no opportunity to be able to recognize karma, causes and effects. So, uh, so therefore, they uh, are bound in this cycle of suffering without their being able to do any control of it. But as a human being, we can control that. We can transcend, we can make tra uh, changes in our lives. So now the question becomes, as a human being, how's that working out for you? Are you really happy with it? Are there some changes you might still like to make? You know? And maybe that's why you're here tonight, or been investigating different traditions, different spiritual traditions and so on, because you realize that our physical life, our intellectual life, has a lot of complications to it. And I'm looking for something that is beyond that, that really begins to put a better focus on what this life is. So we always talk about that we have a physical body, we have an intellectual body, but we also have a spiritual body. So this is what we are trying to become aware of, is our spirituality, our spiritual body and find that these three are very, very um, uh, linked together. And although we may not recognize our spiritual body, it's still there. And so what we're trying to do now through our, our, uh, our teachings, through our, our practices and so on, is to uncover that, to reveal that, to be able to see that. And as we do that, we realize that we have this true nature that is within ourselves, this indestructible true nature that we call Buddha, for lack of, a, of another word. But there's many other words. You can say the Christ. You can say, you might be able to say a God, a particular God or something, that there is this indestructible essence that is within us that is pure um, kindness, pure compassion, pure joy, and pure equanimity, pure sameness in all things. And, it's, and this is covered up. It's blocked up through our emotions and through our ignorance, through our not being aware of what this wisdom that we have, this innate wisdom that we have within us is. So we've been looking at ways of how we stabilize our, our intellectual mind and our physical body to be able to use that energy that comes from our physical body and our intellectual mind and direct it right into our spirituality. So now it's one-pointed mindfulness on our spirituality and we can really recognize it and see what the blockages are and see what, how we can undo those blockages and to develop the tools to be able to do that and so on. So as we're doing that, we realize that we need some help. To do this by ourselves is very, very, very difficult and very rare for human beings to be able to do this. It's not to say that there aren't special human beings who have the karma from previous lives to be able to recognize you know, this, this uh, dilemma, this, this um, suffering that they're in and realize that they're responsible for this and how to undo this, and they can do this 
by themselves, which seems to be by themselves. But for the rest of us, we recognize that we need to have help. We need to have teachers. We need to have scripture. We need to have a system that we can follow. And Buddhism is one of those systems. It's not the only system. There's many other systems. And, and, but Buddhism, for, for me anyway, is very articulate. And it's very non-judgmental. It's very wise. It's very practical. So this is why I've found that this gives a, a, a way to be able to intellectualize what this whole process is without any kind of, uh, any kind of prejudice or, or confusion. It, re it removes that. It removes the mysteries. You know, a lot of traditions create these mysteries, which are devices that some of the people might use to maintain their control over other people. And that's a trap. We don't want to do that. So in Buddhism, we do everything we can to avoid that kind of a trap. So, so we ask teachers, we get books, we look for guidance and so on. So now the question becomes, excuse me one second. Okay. So uh, the question becomes, when we run out of teachers, what do we do? What is the best teacher that we can use? When we, we've been talking about shamatha meditation, calm abiding meditation. And in calm abiding meditation, we're, we're trying to just relax our mind. We're trying to develop one-pointed mindfulness, a focus on one particular thing, maybe our breath, maybe a, an object that our eyes are focused on. And whenever our mind wanders to bring it back to that. And we have these, these moments of, of, of a long period where there seems to be no thought. And then when there comes thought, we know how to get it back to that no thought again. We have this calm abiding uh, meditation, the shamatha meditation it's called. And then we found, then we studied that, that during this time, thoughts do come up. And many of the thoughts that come up are everyday mundane thoughts. And we learned that it's very easy for us to be able to um, put them aside and not have to pay particular attention to them at this time. You know, there are everyday thoughts like maybe I got to make a phone call. I got to, you know, I got to go get a loaf of bread or I got to, you know, uh, do something that seems to be important or something like that. So you can make a note for yourself while you're in your meditation so you don't forget something that comes up that might seem to be important. But you can, you can push that to the side. But then there are thoughts that come up that are these deep wisdom thoughts, these thoughts that we may not have known that we could have, that we've been reading and we've been studying and we've been talking about, you know, this, this spirituality that comes up and comes up in all this symbolism. And we use all these different kinds of iconography, all these different kinds of Buddhas and Bodhisattvas and pictures and statues and designs of mandalas and things like that to help us to intellectualize what all this is so that we can begin to organize our, our mind, our intellectual mind about what this spirituality stuff is all about. It speaks to us in this symbolism and something that is beyond our normal ability to be able to think about it as human beings. So this stuff is transcendent. We say it's transcendent of our human nature. And what we're trying to do is we are trying to stabilize our, what we would call our Buddha nature, or this true nature that we have within ourselves that has these different names, Christ and so on like that, and, and to be able to recognize that, to be able to see that. So a problem for us becomes, who do we follow for that? How do we do that? And the answer we find is the best are the Buddhas themselves, the symbols themselves, which speak of, of pure wisdom, which speak of pure compassion, speaks of pure joy, and speaks of pure sameness, equanimity, we say. 
So it's the Buddhas themselves. And these Buddhas have these characteristics and so on. And it's kind of like a diamond. I use the expression for the, the visualization of a diamond. You look at the diamond and the diamond is, is clear. It may have a pink color or a yellow color or just perfectly clear. And you look inside that diamond and it has all those perfect qualities of what we call bodhicitta, the holy enlightened mind. It has that perfect, all those perfect qualities in there. But it has all these different facets. And the different facets are these different Buddhas. And what these Buddhas represent is the activity of that bodhicitta, of that holy enlightened mind, as it actualizes and is displayed, comes out in our lives. So it begs us to want to investigate what all that means, what all that Buddha is, what that awareness is. The literal meaning of Buddha in Sanskrit is the awakened one, to be aware. That's the literal meaning. It has many other meanings, you know, like being a teacher and so on like that. And it's all valid. But the essence of it is to be aware, aware of all these things that are including the transcendent. So we need to recognize that. So we need to develop a way to be able to recognize the Buddha nature within ourselves. So in the middle way, in the sutra traditions, it's teaching about um, how to behave uh, in, in a, a society among people and so on. It's developing loving kindness, compassion, joy, and equanimity. It's also understanding the compounded empty nature of all things. So we spent a lot of time talking about these things, so I can't go into a lot of detail now. But this emptiness is a key element that all this phenomenal nature that we are all part of and so on is all compounded. It's all empty of its own pure nature. But there is this indestructible true nature that we are, that is, that is, um, that subsumes subsumes that emptiness. So the Buddhas reveal this. The Buddha teachings reveal this. And so when we move then from the next phase, um, well, let me back up just a little bit. The first part of the Buddha's teachings was to learn discipline. So if we don't have discipline, we can't meditate, we can't organize our thoughts, we can't um, lead a virtuous life and so on. So then once we establish that and are pretty stable in that, then we go to this middle way. We go to the, to the, uh, to the Sutrayana, to the Mahayana, where we develop the understanding of the Bodhisattva, the holy enlightened being. And we understand Bodhicitta and we understand the emptiness and so on. So we develop that. And then when we get strong in that, when we get stable in that, now it's time to get to the wisdom part of being a Buddha. And that's called the Vajrayana or the Tantrayana. And that's what Tibetan Buddhism is all about. The Buddhism that is in India, the Buddhism that is in Southeast Asia is a combination, depending on where you are going, maybe either that the, the early stage of just discipline or it may be the discipline and then the sutrayana, the development of understanding of emptiness. Or it may, or, or, or some combination of those two. So in Southeast Asia, for instance, you see the monks that are wearing the saffron yellow and so on. And they're known as the Theravadan monks. And they're the, uh, that's the old school. And that's the real discipline school. And they don't get into these into the Tibetan Buddhism. They don't get into the, the middle way. Then you go up into China, you go up into Japan, you go up into Korea, you go into uh, Vietnam and places, then they're into the middle way. Zen Buddhism is a, a characteristic of that. So you see that 
that there are, there are things that you already know that, that maybe you don't understand what, what they are talking about in these terms, but that's middle way. That is, that is the Mahayana. But then this next level is the Vajrayana, is the Buddha nature, learning Buddha nature, the wisdom of Buddha nature, and so on. So who better to learn this from but the Buddhas themselves? So this is what we need to do. This is where we are tonight. This is where we begin. So this is on chapter seven in the book, the um, stages of meditation. So it's very well articulated here. This is chapter seven, and this is how to meditate on the development stage of skillful means or the generation stage of deity yoga. Deity yoga means these Buddhas. Not that they're deities like gods, it's that they are these meditational deities that are very, very pure. They are so pure, they're unborn. But they are symbols of, of, of attainment, of human beings being able to transcend their human nature into this spiritual level. So we have to first be able to generate the understanding of what that is, the visualization. We have to use our senses as a means to be able to, to get us to a point that we can then leave that and then go into that meditational field, into that Buddha field, and be able to experience that Buddha field. And there's many different Buddha fields. Like I said, there's that diamond with many different facets. And each one of those facets is a different Buddha, and each of the different Buddhas represent a different activity of Buddha nature. So anybody have any questions or comments before we continue on? I have a question later on, uh, Lance. Okay. I hope I didn't lose anybody there. So, um, one of the features of Vajrayana Buddhism, Vajra means indestructible. A Vajra is, uh, is a very powerful. Uh, in Hinduism, a Vajra is like a, a thunderbolt. But here this goes beyond that. You know, in, in Buddhism, the Vajra means indestructible. So we most usually think of it as indestructible wisdom. We think of this Vajra in our heart center. That we have this the, from the time that we are conceived all the way through our entire lives. And for most of us, it's all blocked up. We don't recognize it. Our job now is to reveal that, to be able to understand this indestructible nature. So what we are trying to do is to use the analogy of a gardener. We're trying to ripen the fruit that we have been cultivating through all these other stages of meditation that we've gone through with chapter one, chapter two, chapter three, et cetera, and so on to go through. Now we want to get to the ripening stage so that all this comes together. And now we have the fruit of recognizing that Buddha nature. So one of the unique um, um, uh, parts of Vajrayana Buddhism, of, of Tibetan Buddhism, is what's called the empowerment. And the empowerment is a ceremony that is like an initiation it's like an explanation it's a teaching done by a uh, ordained lama someone who has gone through many many years of of training and practice and has been able to demonstrate to the elders to to their teachers that they are worthy to be able to teach other beings and to be able to introduce these empowerments to be able to practice this deity yoga, this Buddha yoga to other people and so on. So I'm not one of those ordained people. 
However, I can give some introduction. I've had many, many empowerments, and I've done many, many practices, and I've asked permission to be able to, to give these kinds of talks, these kinds of introductions, and I've been given permission to be able to do that. What this will enable you to do <clears throat> is to be able to follow along in the practices and to be able to recite the mantras that are the vocalizations, that are the intellectualizations of the, the power of, of these Buddhas. You would be able to do that. And then when you have the opportunity to take an empowerment, you should take the empowerment. So that now you are receiving all the the um, the nuance, the, the 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 detail, and most importantly, the heart transmission that comes from the Lama to each and every one of us that is in the midst of receiving the empowerment. So it's not so much what they say, although that's a large part of it. But most importantly, it's what comes from the heart. And the heart center is where this true nature is, where this Buddha nature is. What we hear and see is all coming from the intellect. And because it comes from the intellect, it's very easily confused. There's emotions that get involved. There's lots of things that can get involved. But it's from the heart is the most important thing. So we take these empowerments over and over again, and they're like refining. You know, every time we take it, it gets refined a little bit more. We understand a little bit more. We have a little bit more experience as we continue to do the practices. Because part of the empowerment is to commit to doing the practice. So... Doing the practice means going through all these stages, the stages of meditation, developing this one-pointed mindfulness to be able to get to this point, to be able to have these manifestations of wisdom that come to us and so on. So, so, um, so the empowerment is a key element here. And um, I'm certainly hopeful that in the next year, that Kempo and the other teachers uh, we'll be giving more and more empowerments and that you'll be able to partake of those empowerments either personally or maybe through Zoom and, and places like that. But uh, wherever you can, you should. So it's said that we can attain enlightenment through our meditations, through the practices. So in other words, if we receive these teachings, if we receive these empowerments and we continually to practice and lead a, a virtuous life and so on, then it will be motivation enough and it will be, um, um, well, it'll be motivation enough for us to purify our lives and our activities that in seven lifetimes that we would be born enlightened that we would have an enlightenment in our, life, in our lifetime, is what it said. There's others that say, once you begin to do these practices, and you really are committed to these practices, within three lifetimes you can have. In Tibetan Buddhism, they also say that this is possible in a single lifetime. And there are many, many biographies, there's many stories that you can read and hear about in the teachings about those beings who did it in what seemed to be like a single lifetime. What we don't understand, what we don't see, are the prior lifetimes that they had, where they were going through purification, 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 to get to this single lifetime, this lifetime that we now recognize and hear about, where it seems as though they achieved enlightenment in this lifetime. But it was also a product of all these past times. So it's like the uh, it's like the, uh, the, the iceberg, you know, that's in the ocean. You know, you see the iceberg, but what you don't see is what's underneath the ocean. And there's this huge block of ice that is beyond, below that that you don't recognize. So in any of these cases, it's getting on the path. It's purifying. It's seeing our virtue, recognizing our non-virtue 
being able to understand the, what causes all this and then being able to use the tools and techniques that we learn to be able to, to um, cut through all those uh, confusions, all those emotions, all that ignorance and so on. So there's, there's two paths that we're, that we're following in this particular part right now. There's this development stage that we're talking about of Vajrayana, of, of this generation stage of what it is to be a Buddha. And then there's the completion stage. The completion stage is now you have attained it. You've had this experience. You've completed this. Now, what do you do with it, and how do you how do you stabilize that? So there's two paths on this. So we're concentrating on the first path right now. So and we'll continue this tonight, and probably another another time after this. So the first part of this is to have a target. What are we going for? What is our goal? We have to have an idea where we want to do. If we want to take a trip, if we want to go to New York, we got to have a plan. I want to go to New York. And then you start setting about, well, how do I go to New York? And you need all the things that you, you need to get there. You need a train ticket. You need a bus ticket. You need a car. You need a map. You need directions. All these things. You need money. All these things. You know, well, the same is true with a meditative goal, that you have to have a goal. Where do you want to go? So if we say, I want to be enlightened, well, that's a wonderful goal, but what does that mean? You know, so we could say, okay, that goal is uh, to be a Buddha. A Buddha is enlightened. So therefore, to be enlightened, I want to be a Buddha. Okay, well, that's fair. And then we have to, now we have that target of enlightenment. We have that target of being a Buddha. Now we say, how do we get there? What do we do to get there? So once again, we're going through the stages of meditation. One of the things that we have to realize is that we are on a ground. We are on a ground. And this ground has a pathway to our goal and the pathway leads to this fruition or this result or this goal what we find out is that when we are here on the ground we decide that this is what we want to do we're developing all the skill to be able to to do this and then we get on the path and we begin to exercise those skills we begin to practice those skills over and over and over again. And many times we fail. It doesn't always work for us, you know, but, but we have determination. We, we have the skills to help us, to keep us focused. We have the, the, the support with our brothers and sisters and with our teachers to keep us on the path. And then we get to the goal. Then we have a glimpse of the goal. And for a time, maybe it's just a finger snap but maybe it's a few minutes. Maybe we have some experience of being in that goal. And one of the things that you realize is that you were there already, that everything was there in the ground where you started. But we were confused. We didn't have the clarity. We didn't have the understanding. We didn't have the wisdom to recognize that we had it already. So. I hope that doesn't defeat your, your initiative to want to continue doing this. But the point is that the perfection of being, of attaining this goal is being on the path, not the goal itself. It's being on the path. If you already recognize that, you wouldn't even be here tonight. You wouldn't be paying attention to what we're saying. You'd be out being a Buddha, doing the things that a Buddha would do. So you knew that you wouldn't need to do this unless you were here for the benefit of others because that's the thing that the Buddhas do do is everything is for the benefit of the enlightenment of all beings. So if that was here to support the Dharma teachings, well, that would be a good reason to be here. So 
for us to be able to get on that path of perfection and to be able to have glimpses of that goal is what we're trying to do. And it may take us a lifetime. It may take us several lifetimes. It, we may have it, those glimpses over and over again. If, if your you know, uh, meditative career ahead of you is 20 or 30 or 40 years, you may have many, many, many glimpses of that. And those glimpses may turn into these visions, into these long episodes and so on, of being able to be in one-pointed mindfulness of this wisdom and so on. And that would be wonderful. That would be a great victory. You would be a conqueror. And that would be a wonderful thing to do. So, <clears throat> so on the ground, on the path, we're going through this purification process of all this accumulated um, misconceptions that we have, mental misconceptions, uh, ego trips that we have placed on ourselves and everybody else around us, uh, and, and, and habitual tendencies, bad habits that we have picked up uh, over our lifetime and, and prior lifetimes that we've allowed to continue in this lifetime and so on. <clears throat> so, we need to recognize all these things that, that happen, all these confusions. So again, this is what we've been talking about in the prior weeks. Um, let me see, I'm probably making a lot of noise in the microphone here. Um, so it says here, Kempo says, the basic ground is that which must be recognized. The path is that which enables us to recognize it, and the path is that which enables us to realize the result, which is what we aim to realize. In addition, the basic ground and the, ba and the result should be known as one and the same, the essence, the one essence. So these points should be well understood, whether it is in the context of the ground, the path, or the result, our basic nature, our true essence is unchanging, beyond waxing or waning, like the moon. Waxing, it's getting bigger, or waning when it gets smaller. Or, or wanting beyond anything to be denied or anything to be asserted. So we see that there is this transcendence, there is this, this, this uh, energy that we are picking up on. And, um, and all these, these um, techniques are flowing in this in this uh, in this uh, energy. Mm. So it says this is why, just as an imaginary son in a dream will never actually be born and can never therefore die, in the ultimate nature all is equal beyond increase or depletion. Knowing this point is important for the path of both sutra and mantra. So the mantra is the, the tantra, is the vajrayana. So what this means is, if, if you have a dream that you have a son, but the son dies in the dream, that, and you, in the dream you feel terrible, but you wake up and you realize it was just a dream. And for our lives, we begin to see our lives much in the same way, that our lives are like a dream. You know, where were you at six o'clock tonight or five o'clock? You sit and think about it and it's just like a dream. You know, you can remember certain aspects about it, but you're not there anymore. It's just like being in a dream. So the point here is, if we do not understand this point, we think one day far off in the future, I will achieve the result, that I, I will dream that I will have the result of being enlightened, that I will be a Buddha. And that's mistaken, that we have to work for that. It is a development. It is going through and peeling away blockages and confusions and so on. It doesn't happen by itself. So it means that there is a, a, a lack of fundamental understanding of the view, the meditation and the action. 
That is why, first of all, we need to familiarize ourselves with this point. Once we have a clear understanding of this point, we can enter onto the path. So from the ground onto the path. So now we come and we're going to recognize that there are these qualities that are within us that we have not been recognizing. So the deity that we are accomplishing is already within us. All this is within us already. When we were conceived, all this was there. And then as we've gone through the process of being born and then growing up, once we're born and growing up and everything, what we have been doing is constantly putting stuff on top, blockages on top of that essence of when we were conceived. So that deity is already there and all these deities are already there. This true ultimate deity of the absolute nature is the self-arising wisdom awareness, the mandala of bodhicitta. So that's a big statement. And so when the, the Bardo Todal, we've been talking about this, that there is this, this Buddha field, there is this, this, um, this um, family, there is this palace that the Buddha is involved in. And it's all the component parts and so on that are all meditational, that are all to be experienced and so on. And we, we recognize this as the self-arising wisdom awareness. So going back 10 minutes ago, I said when we were in shamatha meditation and these thoughts come up during our vipassana meditation, these thoughts come up. This is the arising wisdom awareness. So sometimes they've been coming up in our lives already but we haven't recognized them as what they are. We might have thought, oh, that's a really nice thought. Oh, I, I really do have compassion for people. I really do love people. I really do want to help people and, and do all these things and so on. But you don't recognize it as this, this wisdom awareness, as this true nature that we have. So what we want to do is to recognize and stabilize that. And that becomes our Buddha field. That the parts of our Buddha field. So all phenomena of the world of appearance have never been separate from this, from the from this from the basic state. So in other words, all this phenomenal nature that we see is all pure in its own way, in its own sense. We condition it. We are the ones who interpret all this phenomenal nature. We're the ones that label it as being good or bad or happy or sorrowful. All these different things that we condition, all these emotions that we place on all this display. Of what is Can I ask a question? Yes. Um, I have never gotten a good fix on what the precise definition of phenomenal is. Can you, can you spend a, just a moment on that for me? Okay. Phenomenal to me means unexplainable. That is beyond our ability to be able to say what it is, what the cause of it is, what the state of it is, the present state, and where it's going to go. That it's phenomenal. This phenomenal world we talk about. This phenomenal world is temporary. We think of it as being permanent. We think of the cosmos. We think of all these things, all these material things that we have here as being permanent, as being solid, as being, you know, uh, real, that are never going to go away. But we, the more we investigate all these material things, and we look down, we look down, we look down, we get down into the atomic structure, and then we get down into the subatomic structure that we've been able to, um, to understand through science, and then we can get down to this energy, and then we find that there's 
a phenomenal nature to this. There's yet stuff there that we haven't been able to explain. And where this all came from, what the Big Bang is, you know, what, is, what kind of a dynamic are we in right now? Who could have predicted, you know, what we're going through right now? Many people did, but for most of us, you know, it's taken us all by surprise about this disease thing and everything. And maybe this is the precursor of something else that is even more diabolical than what we're involved in right now. So what's the future going to be? So all this is phenomenal. How did it get here? I don't know. What is it now? I really don't know. Where is it going to be in next week or next year or five years or a hundred years from now? I don't know. Do you know? Does anybody know? It's phenomenal. So all this stuff that we think is real is just phenomenal. Unless you can tell me or you can tell the rest of us what it is how it got here, where it's going to go. So part of our awareness is recognizing that truth, recognizing that reality. That's one of the two truths, that everything is relative. Everything is phenomenal. We explain things through the relationship of other things. Everything is compounded of other things and so on. So this is the phenomenon. The absolute is something that is beyond that, you know. But to say that beyond brings a, a, a concept. It makes it a concept. And so there is this conceptuality that we use to examine this. And we can say there's an absolute awareness to that. But there's something that is beyond that. And beyond is a conceptual word. And it becomes an experience that we can't intellectually or vicariously know what that is. To know, to really, to know it. We have to experience it. We have to experience it. And in, for spirituality, that experience comes through one-pointed mindfulness where we can transcend our physical body, transcend our intellectual body, and become pure spirit, what we would call pure spirit. Some people might call pure mind. But those are all concepts. But to have something that is so profound. So this is the experience of, of the great yogis. This is the experience of the, of the great siddhas. This is the experience of the great bodhisattvas, of the great beings. So, um, and we have it glimpse by glimpse, glimpse by glimpse. So I hope that gave a little bit of an explanation, Gary. Your microphone's muted. Your microphone's muted. Gary, did you want to say something? Okay, well, we couldn't hear you. So if you want to say something, you got to turn your microphone on. Okay, can you hear me? Yes, now. Yeah, you answered my question uh, with, with several others, but I think that's what this is really all about. <laughs> okay, <laughs> all right. So, yes, go ahead. That was helpful for me too, thank you. What is, is part of arising and cessation, is that also part of phenomenal nature? Is Of course. That, okay. Okay. Yeah, because well, um, Buddha mind would be, well, it just is. There, like you said, beyond concept, there is no arising. There is no cessation. Cor correct? Correct. Yes. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Everything, being a human being is being phenomenal. Yeah, yeah. Everything that happens in the realm of being a human being is phenomenal, mm -hmm. is relative. And that's why we say we have to transcend our human nature. But we're very thankful that we have our human nature. Because if you remember in the very beginning of the talk, I said that there's six realms 
that we could be in the God realm, the jealous God realm, the human realm, the animal realm, the, um, uh, the hungry ghost realm, and the hell realms. And it's only in the human realm that we can recognize this, that we can make the changes. That's, what's, that's what is so precious about being a human being. Yeah, being a virtuous so human being. Yeah, that, that's, that's coming. I mean, that, that makes so much sense to me knowledge-wise, but with the Bardo Total teachings, it, it comes to light in a different way, too. It's, it's yeah, it's, it's very true. Yeah, thank you. Okay, you're welcome. Thank you. Okay. Mm. So, back to the book. So, uh, however, for sentient beings who do not realize this, what we've just been talking about, um, oneself and the deity appear to be separate entities. To say that, that, um, that me and my thoughts, and if my thoughts are these Buddhas, are two separate things. But what we, rec what we come to realize is that the Buddhas are, we are the Buddhas. We are part of the Buddhas. The, the, the Buddhas are our highest nature, our purest nature, our most virtuous nature, our, our awakened nature. And what we're trying to do is to get there and then to sustain that. And we do that for the benefit of the enlightenment of other beings. Because one thing that the Buddhas are not is selfish. So we have to, we're, we're recognizing all this. And how does this manifest? How do I do this? Well, the Buddhas teach us how to do this. So these deity yoga practices, generating the Buddha, taking the empowerments, and then practicing them, is the way in which we do this. So, when we are totally fettered, encased in the cocoon of karma and emotional poisons, the deity is the embodiment of wisdom, the wisdom of liberation. So all this can be explained that we are suffering in this ocean of, of delusion, the suffering of of, of ignorance, of not realizing who we are, and having all these other emotions, but the Buddha represents the liberation from all that. So fully actualizing the true nature, this dharmata, this self-benefit is brought to fulfillment. For the benefit of others, it means one, immeasurable wisdom. Two, it means love. Three, it means the power prayers of aspiration and great wisdom and great wisdom appear in the symbolic mudra of the deity, such as Manjushri, Yamantaka, and other peaceful deities, along with the, uh, man, uh, the mandala of emanations. So what this means is that we recognize this immeasurable wisdom and then we recognize this love and we, the power of our focus, the power of our practice. You know, many beings that I know personally, and I'll tell you myself, my, my own experience, that when you have these experiences of transcendence and you, you come back into your everyday mind and you finally can talk and then all you can say is, I love everybody, and everybody loves me. Everything becomes love. And that this wisdom, this being able to understand this emptiness, now becomes, oh, sure. None of it makes any sense as a human being. I can't comprehend it as a human being. But when I was in that state of mind, when I was in that meditation, I was there. As, and, and that through the focus of my practice, the power of that practice is what takes you there. Those three things is the reality of this coming to, to manifest in, in your 
experience in your life. So many other beings have said the same thing. And for years, I questioned it. For years, I said, was this valid? You know, what was going on? You know, I'm reading books and trying to find things and so on like that. So, and then I, I slowly, and, and the more I talked with more people and, and began and, and challenged it more and more and tested it and everything, I found, yeah, it really was true. So we talked about the experience of the Buddha, Siddhartha Gautama, when he experienced uh, his enlightenment. And for seven weeks, he couldn't talk. It's part of the story of, of the Buddha. For seven weeks, he couldn't talk. He didn't know what to say. Nobody would believe him. But during that time, he was kind of bringing things together. And then he developed the system of the Buddha, the system of Dharma, being able to articulate it to say, I can't give you enlightenment, enlightenment, but I can tell you how I got there. So that's what this is. For me, that's what Buddhism became, became my vehicle because I didn't have the intelligence or the wherewithal to be able to do what the Siddhartha Gautama did, but here's a system already in place that I can use that makes, that is very practical, that makes perfect sense. And I gotta say one point, one little thing here. In asking permission to be able to give these kinds of talks, these teachings and so on, I asked all my different lamas, and I've had many different lamas, and they've all said, teach what you know. Don't get so far out there that you lose understanding of what it is that you teach. So in some of the scriptures, I don't go near them. You know, I can't teach them. I might read them and so on, but I'm not going to teach them because they get too into the minutia of stuff. But with this kind of experience, I've had this experience and, and I share this with you. This is my compassion. This is my loving kindness. This is my joy. And this is my equanimity. So, through the symbolic appearance now of the enlightened form, which are all these Buddhas, the symbolic appearance for our mind to be able to understand these very, very, very subtle concepts, these very subtle thoughts and so on, we, we associate them with this artwork and so on. The system is made up of that. You know, like mnemonics, you know, the word mnemonic, you hear, you hear a sound, you hear a word, you see something, and immediately there's an association with something that seems to be unexplainable. So the symbolic appearance of the deity's enlightened form, the mantra of, of the enlightened speech, and the samadhi awareness of awaken, awakened mind, the deity bestows the cities, the accomplishments, in accordance with our wishes, enacting infallible enlightened activity to establish us everlastingly in the state of eternal happiness, the state of liberation. So what we learn to recognize is the form of the, of the particular deity of the Buddha. You know, they have a white body, what their body position is, you know, if they have multiple faces, why they have multiple faces, what their hand implements are, you know, what, you know, all these different characteristics about them are all indicative of, of their, their nature, that particular activity that they are engaged in. And the activities might be something as simple as wisdom, the activity of wisdom, the activity of compassion, the activity of healing, the activity of fearlessness, the activity of, of, um, of insight, all these different parts. And, and these Buddhas represent these different activities. So when we are doing the practice, we're learning to recognize the deity through their form, what their body looks like and so on, and then what their speech is. And their speech is their mantra. You've all heard the word mantra. You've all probably recited some kind of a mantra. And a mantra is 
literally called a mind protection. That's what it is in Sanskrit. It's a Sanskrit word. And it means mind protection. Because if you are one pointed mindfully concentrating on that mantra, there's no other space. There's no other time. There's no other ability to be thinking of anything else. So your mind is protected by that mantra. And that mantra is usually the name or names or characteristics of that particular Buddha. So when we say Om Mani Padme Hum, which you all probably know is to be the mantra of, of Avalokiteshvara or, or Shenreze, Om Mani Padme Hum, you know, in the literal English translation, it means behold, the jewel in the lotus. So what does that mean? Well, behold, here, awaken, see, here it is. Behold the jewel. So here is the jewel. Here is, you look at the picture of, of Shenreze of, and you see this Buddha and you say, oh, this is a jewel. This is, this is the most valuable thing I've ever seen. This means so much. It means compassion. And here is this jewel. And then the um, uh, Om Mani uh, is the jewel. Padme is the lotus. The, what the Buddha is sitting on, what Shenrezig is sitting on is a lotus flower. Sitting on and a lotus flower means purity. So here's the jewel sitting on a lotus flower. And making this manifest is home to make this manifest. So you're looking at the picture of Shenrezig, Avalokiteshvara, and you're looking at this deity, you're looking at all the characteristics of him and, and thinking, oh, behold the jewel in the lotus, oh, mani babi hung, oh, mani pami hung. And then you bring that around, he sits on your head, and then he comes down through the center of your body into your heart center, and maybe only that tall, and now Shenrezig is inside of you. You become Shenrezig. You become the jewel in the ornament, uh, the jewel in the lotus. You become the deity. That's the power of the mantra. That's the transformative nature of the mantra. And what we're actually doing, we're bringing our physical body, we're bringing our lungs, we're bringing our vocal cords, we're bringing all that power together by reciting this mantra over and over and over and over again until we, we lose sense that this is what we're doing. It just becomes something that is automatic. It becomes one-pointed mindfulness. There's, we're not thinking about it. Concentrating our mind in the beginning, we're concentrating, well, what does this mean? What does this mean? Oh, mani pami hong, oh, mani pami hong. And oh, it means behold the jewel in the lotus. Well, what does this mean? Oh, I got this body, I got this colored body. Oh, he's sitting on my head. Oh, he's coming down on my heart. All these different aspects, but then, the physical body, the utterance of this, and the intellectualization of what this is all comes together. And then it's like a key opening up a lock and our heart opens up. Our spirituality opens up. So this is why in the past number of weeks, I've been encouraging everybody in the beginning of our, of our, our teachings to recite these mantras, to recite these prayers over and over again, because the power of them is one of the techniques that we're able to unlock this, this wisdom, this, this becoming the Buddha. It's how it's done. So we count it and we use the malabees, you know? And we say, we say, okay, I do one mal around. One mal around, you don't even get a buzz, you know? You do 10 mal arounds, you start getting a buzz. And by that buzz, I mean that when you stop reciting, you can literally feel your body vibrating. And your mind, your brain, there's no, there's all that discursive thought, all those other things have just kind of gone away. 
you just kind of blown them away. You do 20 mal rounds and you can't even read. You do 30 mal rounds. And so you do 100,000 recitations over the course of some time, maybe over a couple of months or something like that. And then you find the real power of this. Now, some people would say, you know, this is going to take too much time. This is going to take too much effort. You know, there's got to be a better way. It's got to be an easier way to do this. Well, you could uh, check yourself into Spring Grove, some hospital like that. You get some insulin shock treatment, or maybe you can get an electrical shock treatment. You know, there's some kind of way that maybe you can, you can uh, blow your mind doing this. Maybe you can take some drugs where you can, you know, you can have some kind of a, an experience like that, you know, but you're not in control of it. In meditation, you're in control. It's natural. And yes, we've got guides we've got things that can help us to do it but when it gets right down to it when we become pure natural that's what we're looking for so this mantra is part of the way that we get there so then the samadhi awareness the samadhi is the very deep meditation the samadhi awareness of awakened mind the deity bestows the cities, the accomplishments, in accordance with our wishes, and acting infallible, enlightened activity to establish us everlastingly in the state of eternal happiness, the state of liberation. We recognize Shen Rezo. There it is. I'm Shen Rezo. Now I know. It is a, a gnosis. It is not a um it is not a uh, uh i'm sorry um it's not the kind of thought that you got i used the word before now i can't think of it it's it, it's you actually have the experience and once you have the experience nobody can ever take it away from you you may block it up you may suppress it you may forget it for a time but if you allow yourself enough focus, you can get right back to it. Because once you get it, you never lose it. So then you recognize that deity. Yeah, it's within me. Oh, okay. And then you begin to recognize the other deities. You begin to see their bodhicitta. You begin to see their holy enlightened mind. And you begin to recognize that in that they're the same, they're all the same. But then you say, oh, well, this one does that. Look at the tools he's got in his hands. This one does that. Look at the color of his body. It represents this particular facet of, of his activity. And you begin, and then you begin to, to see how all this works, how all this fits into place. Remember the analogy I've used so many times is this is like a 2,000 piece jigsaw puzzle that we get without a picture and then we take the puzzle and we put it on the table and we've got to put all the pieces out and so what's the first thing we do we find all the straight edges and we find the corners that's pretty easy to do we make the frame and then we start looking at the interior pieces and we start trial and error putting this piece together with that piece and and all this and that's where all the, the work is that's where all the time is to do all that and so on well, this is the same way. We start looking into this. We start looking into our meditative experience and all these pieces start fitting together. All the symbolism starts making sense. We recognize ourselves as the Buddha. And maybe it's just one glimpse at a time, but that's okay. So that's the samadhi awareness. So we develop the visualization of the deity. 
which is the outer part. The recitation of the deity's names, that's the outer part. And the, the, the ceremony or the practice that we do to accomplish the, uh, the realization of that Buddha, that's all outer stuff. But then we come to the inner way to accomplish the deity like this. The deities are within one central channel in the form of the essential wisdom, prajna, or subtle energy of wisdom, and the pure bindu, or the reproductive essences. Now that's got a lot of stuff in there. But the process that happened when we were conceived, Here's the mother, she's got the egg. Here's the father, he's got the sperm. And they're coming together. And here comes this spiritual entity, whatever, however you want to define it for right now, coming in, looking for a place to come to be able to become a body, looking to be able to be born, to be able, because we have desire. We're not able to remain in the bardo of reality we want to be born again we want to have a body and so these three forces are coming together these two physical and here comes the spiritual coming together so this is so this is this essential wisdom this is the the, the subtle energy of this coming together being able to recognize this and to be able to see this transference of consciousness that is sublimating into physicality. When we die, it's the opposite of that. When we die, we've had this energy in our body this whole time, our whole lifetime. And then when we die, we go through this process of ejecting that consciousness. And we have to learn the proper way to do that. Call it the POA practice. It's the, the, um, the transference of consciousness, it's called, of liberating that into the Buddha field, into the Buddha. So all this is by means of being able to identify what that, what that Buddha is. What's our target? Where do we want to go? Now I can really do it because I'm not going to have a body anymore. I'm dying. My physical body, my intellect is gone. I'm going to be nothing but pure spirit. So there's that ejection of consciousness. Here is the, coala the, the, the coalescence of consciousness coming into the egg and the, and the sperm. It's pretty dynamic. So we say this is the pure bindu, the reproductive essences. So all this is in the book. All this is in the book. You can read this in the book. And you need to read this over and over and over and over again. Lance. Yes, sir. Quick question. Sure. So the bindu is the union of the male and the female energy. Is that correct? Right. And the, the spirit. spirit. Yeah. And the spirit. Yes. Yeah. And that is in the central channel and it's in the heart center, right? Well, it's running up and down the heart center. When we die, um, and it comes together. Then it all comes together in the heart center, and that's what we have to eject. But, you know, at different times, it, it, you know, it, it may be up here, maybe down here. You know, it's, it's moving in the state of flux within the center channel. Right. And is the, uh, I think the, the, the female energy is in the lower chakras, as far as I know, and the male energy is in the upper chakras, the head chakras, and the male energy is, is just the technical. I just wanted to make sure that I got this right. Uh, but the male systems energy is, explain it different ways. But the male energy is descended and the female energy is 
ascend, ascendant, right? Well, different, different systems explain it different ways. So I wouldn't get too hung up on it being oh. this way. This is it. You know, we're using concepts to, to explain phenomenal nature. So that's one of the things that we always have to be prepared to do is to give up our mental misconceptions and our habitual tendencies. What does our lineage say about that? To be perfectly honest, I'll have to look and see in a couple of the different practices to make sure I got it right, tell it to you exactly right. Uh, okay. The way I remember it was that there is female energy that comes down and there's male energy that comes up. In that particular practice, I remember it that way, you know, but it's contextual. Gotcha. You know? So I wouldn't want to say that, you know, in different, in different practices, it's different. So, okay. 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 That's one of the places I'm not going to go too far out of bounds. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. All right. So uh, our three doors, along with the phenomena we experience in an impure state, are simply the magical display of our volatile karmic winds. Okay. What does that mean? Our three doors, the body, the speech, the mind. The crown of the head, the throat, and the heart center, the body, speech, and mind, the Buddha, the Dharma, and Sangha. The, this would be the, the body of the Buddha. This would be the speech of the Buddha. This would be the mind of the Buddha. These three doors. So our goal, one of our goals is, is to make our three doors inseparable from the three doors of the enlightened one. Om, ah, home. We do that all the time. So, our three doors, along with the phenomena we experience in an impure state. So, our impure state is our confusion. You know, we don't understand what's going on. So, all this phenomenal stuff is happening to us in this impure state because we're not looking at it in an enlightened mind. We're looking at it with emotion. We're looking at it with wrong view. We're looking at it with, with preconceptions, all these things. And all of this is simply the magical display of our volatile karmic winds. So, so the karmic winds are what that entity, when it's coming to the egg and the, and the uh, sperm, it's being blown, figuratively we say, by these karmic winds to actualize, to coalesce with the egg and the sperm, to become, so these karmic winds are coming. So we have these karmic winds within ourselves. Some of it is like our habitual tendency. And so on. These things that we do, in spite of all the things that we, we try to avoid, we still have these bad habits. We still do these crazy things that we don't understand. And it's unripened karma, stuff that we haven't been able to deal with yet because it, 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 we haven't recognized it. So we have to do that. Through the deities, we now have a pure platform on which to be able to recognize that. Now we have a stability that we can recognize that and not be crushed by it, not be overwhelmed by it. We have a purity with it. And we can say, oh, this is happening, but I'm stronger than that. I can see that this is what's been bothering me. Now I can overcome it. And you transform yourself. This is, this is when you come out of a deep meditation and you have that, that realization, you have that blissfulness, you have that sensation of transformation. Oh, I'm not going back there anymore in terms of 
I, I, I fixed something within myself. I had a transformative, transformative experience. Now I don't have that fear that I used to have. Now I don't have that hatred that I used to have. Have you ever had that experience? You know, where you've done some kind of a meditation or some kind of a practice or something like that. You had a realization and you say, now I see how, how petty I've been all this time. Now I see my ego. Now I see that I've been out of control and now I see that I can control myself and I have to control myself. I take responsibility for it. This is all the transformation. This is all the display of this phenomenal nature and being able to tweak the display. You're an actor in the play, but now you're changing the script a little bit. I'm gonna take that scene out. I'm gonna take that reaction out. I'm not gonna say this anymore. I'm gonna do it this way. So, from one point of view, you can say, you are the architect of your life, and now you are the engineer of your life. Another way of saying it is, I am the playwright of my life, and now I am the editor to the playwright, to the play of my life. I can change it. And I'm sure you've all gone through periods of correction in your lives. So here we're doing it at a very subtle, but very, very trans, transcendent level. Uh, Lance, I have a question about that. Okay. You know, I said that I was going to have a question later. I think this That's is right. maybe <laughs> a right time. And I don't know exactly how to explain this. I'm going to try to. So... I'm going to try to tie this into uh, something that you have mentioned, um, I think, last time. Um, and you were talking about karma. And you were saying that instead of fighting karma and considering everything, all the phenomena that is happening to you as your enemy, you can actually harness the power of karma to your advantage. And, you know, sail on the open sea basically um but uh i guess what i'm trying to to say is this um how does like a practitioner recognize that um recognize when to step back take a step back and say okay this is too much in my life is there's there's a whole lot going on that i just cannot take i cannot tune in into myself into finding my own buddha nature and when can I say that, okay, this is, well, everything is karma, but, you know, this is karma. Something is happening to me. I just have to, you know, um, accept what's going on and move on. And this is just, you know, part of what I am. All right, I think I understand. Okay. And sometimes most of the time we have to say i don't know you know i i and and because i don't know the wise thing is not to do something that can cause harm so to find a comfortable obtainable goal for yourself to find your your level of buddha field if, if you will that you can continue to grow in because if you're getting out of out of your bounds and you're not ready for that you're not prepared for that then you stay where you where you are you know it's like somebody who you know wants to be a brain surgeon and uh they they read some books and so on like that and they go into the into the surgery and they they see the doctors and the nurses all working there on the patient whose brain is being exposed and you say, I'm not ready for this. But I'm going to go back to school and I'm going to get myself more ready for it. I don't give up the ideal that I want to be a brain surgeon, but I just admit to myself, I'm not ready for, for that at a practical level. So the same thing would be true with the spirituality. 
Now, hopefully you're not saying you're going to give up on spirituality, that you hit some kind of a, a block and you say, you know, the spirituality is just beyond what I, what I imagine, what I want to do or anything like that. I'm not ready to give up my, you know, my ego and all this. Um, so I hope it's not at that level. I hope it's just no. No, it's not. Uh, and, and what you're saying makes perfect sense. Um, is like, you know, on the opposite side, like, you know, what if there's too much going on in my life and, you know, I'm ready to give up some of the things that I do in order to stay on the path, um, you know. Well, things change. Adrian, you know, um, Look, I'm, I'm 73 years old, <laughs> okay. you know, and when I was your age, I, I imagine what, you're about 35 or 40? When I was your age, right. you know, I knew I had lots of limitations. I didn't have the time. I didn't have the resources. I didn't have the teachers at that time. I had experienced things when I was in my 20s. You know, I had met people that just came from... Uh, Nepal and they had all these drawings and I started reading books you know about Buddhism and everything and but I knew at that time I couldn't absorb it all and do all the things I had to do in my practical life but I never lost sight that I was going to do it I still maintained meditation I still medita meditated in the best way I could and there's many different meditation techniques you know but it wasn't until I got to be 50, 55 years old that I said, now is the time for me to recommit to my spiritual life. So as long as we stay on the path, we're good. As long right. as I don't dash for the top of the mountain, right. basically, right. Um, in a sprint, yeah. um, you know, but every day i put you know one foot in front of the other yeah I'm, I'm good and just go with a gut feeling about my experiences on the path go slow or go faster yeah and be thankful yeah. for that have great gratitude for that and absolutely you have great teachers you have great books you have great brothers and sisters around you we need that to be developed you know what do you want for your children what do you want for your grandchildren do you want them to have to discover this all by themselves or do you want to create and maintain the facilities so they don't have to reinvent the wheel every generation? So that takes energy too. So we say, okay, I'm working to do these things. You know, um, back in the day when, when uh, uh, I first started going to a Dharma center, there was, uh, you know, there was a shrine room and there's 40 people in the shrine room and the, and the teacher is there and he's giving all these great teachings. But there were these couple people that were always in the kitchen. They were always making lunch for everybody. And the Lama would say, they're practicing compassion more than you guys sitting in here in the shrine room are practicing compassion. Because they're not... You know, they're giving up whatever they think that they need to have, whatever we think sitting in the shrine room, we think we need to have, whatever intellectualization is, they're actually practicing bodhicitta by sacrificing what we might think they need to have. They're doing that so that everybody can have nourishment so that we could go back into the shrine room. Their, their, their enlightenment was was going to be greater than those guys in the shrine room. So there's a very practical aspect to Buddhism. Does that make sense? So whatever way that we can work for the Dharma is all good stuff. Somebody's got to mow the lawn, somebody's got to paint the, the window or the paint the, the you know the, the room. Somebody's got to, you know, shovel the snow. Somebody's got to cook the lunch. All these practical things still got to happen. Thanks, Lance. Okay. You're welcome.
So, um, does anybody need a break? <laughs> we got a few minutes. Anybody want to stand up and stretch? If you do, just stand up and stretch. But I'll keep on talking. So, um, so now we come to. So we're talking about this karmic winds. We're talking about you know here we are. We're in this in this mode of the, the, this display and so on. So now, therefore, we need to visualize the innately present mandala of the deity that has always been present within the space of our subtle channels or nad eyes, nad eyes. We accomplish the mandala inseparable with the subtle wind or prana. We accomplish the mandala, excuse me, we accomplish the mantra inseparable with the subtle wind or prana. I'm gonna say it again. We accomplish the mantra. Remember the mantra? The mind protection, the utterance of the name of the Buddha, of the activity of the Buddha. We accomplish that with the subtle wind or prana. The subtle wind is prana, is our breath. So our body, our physical body, has this wisdom in it. This is why body, speech, and mind come together. Remember the story of the Buddha, going back when, when before he became enlightened and he went off with his five friends into the caves. And the, and the mode that they were trying to do was that they were going to renounce their life, renounce their body. They were going to stop eating until they dropped dead, and then they would have enlightenment. But they found out that they couldn't think anymore. They couldn't sit upright. They couldn't practice anymore. They couldn't do their chanting anymore. It became self-defeating. That there was all this great suffering that they couldn't overcome. So the Buddha, he left. He says, I'm going to go back down to the village. And he started eating. And then he got his body strong again. And he realized then that you need the physical body. You need the intellectual mind and you, to open up the spiritual body. The three go together. It's not a two-legged stool, it's a three-legged stool. So the subtle wind, so this prana is the mantra, the voice of the Buddha, the sound of the Buddha. You know, in in um in the Bodo, Bodo, Bardo Toto, we're talking about let let the sound be my sound. Let the light be my light. May the rays be my rays. The sound is the sound, is the, the voice. The, the light is the intellect. And the, the rays are the body. All right. So the term city... S-I-D-D-H-I refers to various yogic attainments, yogic attainments. So yoga is a Sanskrit word that means union. So the cities are the accomplishments of that union. And we're always working on that union. Our goal is to become the Buddha, to become totally the Buddha, to become in inseparable from that which we call the Buddha, the enlightened one. That's, that's the attainment that we are working for. That, and the yoga, the yogi or the yogini, the female yogi is working for that union, developing that union over and over again. So we say that these attainments can be either common or supreme. The common cities are powers such as clairvoyance the ability to read the thoughts of others, and the ability to fly through the air. The Supreme City is the attainment of enlightenment. So, I don't know what you guys know about, you know, India and uh, the fakirs. You know, these yogis that would do, sleep on a bed of nails or walk across hot coals and would, you know, do all these things, you know, that 
that seem to be, you know, great hardships to prove their their invincibility and their their transcendence and so on. All this stuff is common stuff. It's like parlor room tricks, you know, the the clairvoyance to know what people are thinking, you know. That's pretty easy. You know, you get into this and People have limited thoughts, you know, and, and you can be in a situation and you can predict what a number of people are doing, you know, if you, you know, once you get the hang of, of how things work within your own mind, you can then predict how things work with other people's minds too. And to read the tells, you know, as they would say in cards, you know, you know, you read the tells, you know, people are giving themselves away. So you read the tells, you know how to do that. And they say, oh, wow, he's so wise, he's so enlightened, or something like that. And the ability to fly through the air. Well, I haven't mastered that at all. I haven't had any experience with that. So whether that is a figurative thing, but I look at it as the, 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 the transpersonal, the, the, ability, the ability to be able to transcend space and time. And when the Buddha attained enlightenment, that he went into that to be able to see the past lives of his past lives, to see past lives of others, to see the, the lives of others as they are right now, and to see the lives of others in the future. This is like space travel. This is like flying through the air. You know? But he saw it as, as just something that was that was you know, rather mundane compared to enlightenment. So the supreme city is the attainment of this enlightenment. And this enlightenment is liberation. Liberation from all this phenomenal nature. Liberation from all these games. Preparing ourselves for the Bardo Todal. Preparing ourselves to be a Buddha. Preparing ourselves to be able to lead other beings to enlightenment. So we have to question our motivation. We have to question our goals. We have to look at it a little bit at a time. Not allow ourselves to be overwhelmed with the big picture, but just look at it as developing virtue and developing purification of non-virtue, just being a better human being. You know, the, the essence of Buddhism is, is the philosophy of being a good person. Everything else will take care of itself after you do that. The first thing that the Buddha taught was, was discipline. Have discipline for yourself. Control yourself. And he enumerated the, the different crimes or the different sins or the, the different things that we do that are so harmful to ourselves and to others and to cut ourselves off from the causes of those things. We cut ourselves off from the causes, we don't have to worry about the karma because there'll be no action. And therefore, there'll be no result. So karma, what are we trying to do with karma? We're trying to neutralize karma. We're trying to have no karma. We can have good karma, and we say, oh, that's great, you know, but the good karma we use to be able to overcome the difficult karma and be able to have no karma. The Buddha sees, the awakened one, sees all the karma, sees all the suffering, sees all the samsara, but is not, is not moved by it one way or the other. But the hand is always there to help beings who want to be liberated from that suffering, whatever form it takes. The Bodhisattva Shenrezig, Avalokiteshvara, 
Bodhisattva of compassion, great being, enormous, sheds tears because all the work that he has done has brought, is still not making a, a big difference in, in the lives of people who are caught up in samsara. So he's suffering, he's feel, he recognizes this suffering and the tears turn into Buddha Tara, the female Buddha, the mother of all the Buddhas who says, Shanreze, I'll help you. I will bring protection to all these beings. I will bring fearlessness to all these beings so that they can have time to be able to understand compassion, the cause of their suffering and how they can use that compassion to overcome suffering in their lives and then the lives of others. So Buddha Tara came to Bodhisattva Shenrezi Avalokiteshvara. So all so the root of all this is the chitta, is the heart, and what we call the pavilion of light, and is the subtle bodhicitta essence with the nature of unchanging great bliss. By turning one's attention to the unconditioned pure appearance of one's own pure nature, accomplishment comes. So what we do, we're sitting there on the cushion and we're, we're going through all this visualization and so on. And here comes, and, and, and we, 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 div, we cultivate this light, but it's not a light that we see with our eyes. It's a meditation light. And this meditation light is characterized by the Buddhas and the Bodhisattvas, these meditational deities. So the unconditional pure appearance of one's own pure nature, this accomplishment comes, this light comes, this experience comes. So according to the secret level of accomplishment, if we realize the nature of our own mind, primordially unborn, self-arising, primordial knowing, the basic space where all of samsara and nirvana have always been equal, there is no other deity to be accomplished outside or separate from this. So in other words, whatever Buddha you accomplish, whatever enlightenment you accomplish, you accomplish them all. and it becomes effortless. It's spontaneously present. And both samsara and nirvana are nothing beyond the magical expression appearing from that basic space nature. The magical nature, the, the, how do they say, the magical expression appearing from that basic space nature. The space nature being that, that absolute mind of the Buddha, if we can call it that mind, you know, and we're using conceptual thoughts again. We can't help it. So it's got to be experienced to get beyond these words, to be get beyond these, 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 um, these concepts. So don't feel that you got to rush into it. You do a little bit at a time. Got seven lifetimes, got three lifetimes, whatever it is. You've had many, many countless lifetimes already, if you want to look at it in those terms. If that becomes a comfort. You know, but that's a concept too, isn't it? So therefore, practicing in the manner of resting the mind naturally in pure awareness which has always been this effortless, unmodified wisdom is the ultimate profound dharma. So has there ever been a time when you have been someplace? You know, maybe it was on vacation. Maybe it was while you were working. Maybe it was while you were laying in bed. Maybe it was after a, uh, uh, a sexual encounter. 
maybe it was after you know doing some hard work you know where you just kind of sat down or you just laid there or you were in a meditation or something and you had this this feeling this of this feeling of bliss this feeling of of serenity this this awareness of of all things around you just being as one and you didn't have to understand it maybe once in your life you had some experience like that or maybe you you know that you want to have that so this is what we are trying to to develop So we have it spontaneously. We're all spiritual human beings, whether we want to be or not, whether we recognize it or not, we're still spiritual. We can still have these experiences. Maybe it's when you were a kid, when you were five years old or something like that. How many times when you are in meditation, when you go into deep meditation and you've gone through all this stuff and, and you've gotten there and you're really, you're really in a, and something of a samadhi, you're really grooving. And then all of a sudden, a thought comes up that you haven't thought of in 25 or 30 years. Something that happened to you. Sometimes it's a sad thought. Sometimes it's a great thought, a happy thought. But something that has been pushed down comes up. And you greet it. You know, this is, this is karma ripening. You know, this is seeing something as a thought. And being able to know how to deal with it so that's how that's how easy it is for these things to come that's where this wisdom comes from you see by receiving by receiving this sort of instruction the yogin or yogini practices in league with the meditative experience and reaches the understanding that the deity has always been one with one's own mind in the great primordial inseparability. We've already got this in here. Now we're learning a way to be able to explain it. This recognition is the great innate accomplishment. This is the greatest of all gifts. All phenomena accomplished, in, no, excuse me, all phenomena encompassed by samsara and nirvana have never truly existed from their own side. All this is phenomenal. Everything that we think of is conceptual, is phenomenal. So it's all, it's only truly existed from its own side, from their own side. So there's always that dualistic mind, a dualistic thought. So, you know, how can we have alternative truths? Well, in this mind, it really believes it. This mind believes the other side. Are they both real? Well, they both really believe it. But they're both empty of their own true nature. They're both phenomenal. They're both emptiness. They're both conceptual. This recognition is the great innate accomplishment all is merely the spontaneous reflection of mind and primordial knowing awareness. All is merely spontaneous reflection. Spontaneous reflection of this display, of this dualistic nature, like looking into a mirror, the spontaneous reflection of mind and primordial knowing awareness so here is this display but then here is the knowing that it's a display knowing that it's not real and the two are happening simultaneously this is the relative nature and the absolute nature So primordial knowing, too, is none other than the nature of mind. Right at this very moment, for each and every one of us, the true nature of our minds is this. Equanimity wisdom. The nature of primordial knowing. 
unceasing present awareness and emptiness luminosity. So what this is saying, to put it in other terms, the first avenue of liberation is emptiness. This is emptiness, equanimity, wisdom. It's not, not something newly created, but rather it's innately present, unconditioned by nature, the essence of emptiness. The nature of this emptiness is free from all labels and cannot be described or fit into our conceptual mind as an object of understanding. This is the unceasing present awareness. This is the spontaneous presence. And then the next is the dharmata of equalness, the sphere of, dhar of, of equalness. Beyond anything to be attained or the act of attaining something, there is nothing to which to aspire. This is the third avenue of liberation is not aspiring for a result. This is emptiness, luminosity. This is the clarity. This is beyond any conceptual constructs and being able to abide in them. So for tonight, for tonight, we'll have to leave it here. Any questions or comments? Thank you so much. This was very interesting. I am very um, appreciative of the opportunity to listen. Thank you. Well, you're welcome. Thank you, Thank you Lions. <laughs> okay. Yes. All right, you're all welcome. So remember, it, it, you know, this is deep stuff. You got to read this over and over again, hear this over and over again. I will send you the, if you like, I'll send you the outline for this. Um, uh, so so I, if you, I don't have your email. If you want to send it to me, I'll, I'll put you on our email list if you want. If you don't want to be on it, that's okay. We won't do it. And Shannon, the same thing with you. Uh, be on our email list. And uh, next week, we'll continue this. Uh, this, is, this is going to take a couple of weeks to, to, to explore all the details of this. Unless you tell me you don't want to do it. Uh, 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 thank you. Send it to us, Lance, or at least I have it. Okay. All right. All right. So you see how this dovetails with the Bardo Todal? Yes, definitely. Yeah. Yeah, that's really helpful. Okay. All right. Well, thank you all very much. We need to do our dedication prayers. So um, we always have, there's three parts of every practice or teaching or anything that we do, any study that we do. The first part is to set our motivation, which are the opening prayers, which we did very brief ones when we first started. Then the body is the main part, which was the teaching that we just did. And now whatever merit that we have gained, whatever wisdom that we have gained, whatever skillful means that we have gained through this teaching, we now are dedicating to the enlightenment of other beings. We're not holding it selfishly for ourselves. We're giving it to other beings. So in our prayer book, we'll recite, and if, uh, and, so, um, and Zara and, uh, and uh, Shannon, if you want these books, and uh, remind me uh, through an email, and I'll send you the, uh, the copies of these. Uh, through the email. So we go to page 18 and we recite the dedication prayer. Dorje Chang, Talopa, Naropa, Marpa, Milarepa, and Dormar Largampopa, Pagma Drupa, and Lordri Kompa, please bestow upon us the most auspicious blessings of all the Kaju Lamas. By this virtue, may I achieve the all knowing state. And may all who travel in the waves of birth, old age, sickness, and death cross the ocean of samsara by defeating all enemies, confusion, the cause of suffering. Bodhicitta, the excellent and precious mind, where it is unborn, may it arise. Where it is born, may it not decline, but ever increase higher and higher. I pray that the Lama may have good health. I pray that the Lama may have long life. I pray that your Dharma activities spread far and wide. 
I pray that I may not be separated from you. As Manjushri, the warrior, realized the ultimate state, and as did Samantabhadra, I will follow in their path and fully dedicate all merit for all sentient beings. By the blessing of the Buddha who attained the three kayas, by the blessing of the truth of the unchanging Dharma as such, by the blessing of the indivisible Sangha order, may the merit I share bear fruit. Next page. By the virtues collected by myself and all beings in samsara and nirvana, and by the innate word of virtue, may I and all sentient beings quickly attain unsurpassed, perfect, complete, and precious enlightenment. May the teachings of the great Tree Kumpa Ratna Shri, who is omniscient, Lord of the Dharma, master of interdependence, continue and increase through study, practice, contemplation, and meditation until the end of samsara. Next page is the dedication prayer by Lord Jigen Sungun. Glorious, holy, venerable, precious, kind root and lineage lamas, divine assembly of Yidams and assemblies of Buddhas, Bodhisattvas, Yogins, Yoginis and Dakinis dwelling in the ten directions, please hear my prayer. May the virtues collected in the three times by myself and all sentient beings in samsara and nirvana and the innate word of virtue not result in the eight worldly concerns, the four causes of samsara, or rebirth as a shravaka or pratyaka Buddha. May all mothers sentient beings, boundless as the sky, excuse me, may all mothers sentient beings, especially those enemies who hate me and mine, destructors who harm, misleading Mars, and the hordes of demons, experience happiness, be separated from suffering, and swiftly attain unsurpassed, perfect, complete, and precious Buddhahood. By the power of this vast root of virtue, may I benefit all beings with my body, speech, and mind. May the afflictions of desire, hatred, arrogance, and jealousy not arise in my mind. May attachment to fame, reputation, wealth, honor, and concern for this life not arise for even a moment. May my mind stream be moistened by loving kindness, compassion, and bodhicitta. And through that, may I become a spiritual master with good qualities equal to the infinity of space. May I gain the supreme attainment of Mahamudra in this very life. May the torment of suffering not arise even at the time of my death. May I not die with negative thoughts. May I not die confused by wrong view. May I not experience an untimely death. May I die joyfully and happily in the great luminosity of the mind as such and the pervading clarity of Dharmata. May I, in any case, gain the supreme attainment of Mahamudra at the time of death or in the Bhagavad Gita. Om, ah, hom. Om, ah, hom. Om, ah, hom. May my body, speech, and mind become inseparable with the body, speech, and mind of all the enlightenment. Thank you all very much.